Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Colin Bailey, the newly appointed director of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Let's talk about some of these, these uh, magnificent works. Let's, let's start with a portrait of a, a, of a gentleman who had an amazing impact on the world of art and the world of politics, a sculpture by Cellini. The portrait of Cosimo de' Medici is one of the marvels of the collections. It dominates the room it's in and it's mesmerizing. Cellini was the greatest sculptor of the Renaissance, of the Italian Renaissance, and he worked for the courts of, of Francis, Francois Premier, but he was lured back to Florence by Cosimo, who was, the, the, as you said, the, the, a real force of nature in his 30s. Um, Cellini does a, sculpts a bronze portrait of Cosimo that is in the Bargello. It's one of the masterpieces of the collections in Italy, and it shows him, as it does, as a bellicose Caesar, as a sort of fighter, with this breastplate, the cuirass, these eagle's heads, the Medusa emblem in the middle. He is a man of, of war, and this was not actually what Cosimo was eager to have at this moment. This is the grandest marble bust by Cellini in a collection in this country, and it is something that the museum was so smart to buy in the 70s. What I think is so interesting is the role that art played, because it's different than today's role. The artist was, in many respects, a public relations uh, consultant, a person who thought, of, who had to think about the brand that, that the Domenici wanted to convey, um, had to think about how communication uh, worked. Um, and, of course, needed patrons who were willing to pay for his or her service, well, his services. Uh, yes, Mark, but in a way, the, the artist was also a, a paid craftsman who was, could be quite low on that pecking order. Right. And Cellini is interesting because, of course, he saw himself, I think, in many of the ways that you've just said, but this was out of step with time. So he was someone who really, I think, was often frustrated at not being given quite the um, prominence he deserved, although his, he was sculptor to the most powerful monarchs and rulers of Rena Renaissance Europe. So the artist as, a, as an admired, um, lionized uh, craftsperson, as a visionary, is, is really quite a recent idea. A very recent idea. And it's an I mean, it's interesting because someone like Rembrandt, who had a, a real sense of his role, his work, his sense of place in the world. When we look at his self-portraits, he shows himself as an, often as an aging monarch, as a patriarch. As a, he, he was someone who was deeply aware of, in a way, wanting to be more, to be recognised more, um, and a sense that for his betters, for the patrician for the patricians who commissioned art, both as both portraits and decorations, he was still someone of a guild. So this the status is, a, is an interesting and changing issue. Well, let's talk about Rembrandt. I, I love this portrait. It's of a, of a young um, militia man, a, quite a grand figure, a man called Joris de Calaret, who was from The Hague, and Rembrandt, young, in his late twenties, goes to make a, a, a small number of portraits in The Hague. He may have stayed in this man's inn. He owned an inn called um, the, the, the Great Swan, and perhaps in, in return for lodging, Rembrandt painted the portrait of the man and his son. This is one of these early Rembrandts where the light just emerges from, from almost from, we can't quite see where it emerges from. The man is bathed in a glow. He's shown as a militia man, a quite a high rank in the city of The Hague. He's wearing his gorget, which was a sort of breastplate top. He's got his sword and musket. But what, what he's wearing in his buff-colored coat, he's waiting for the armor to be placed over him. So this is a sort of military portrait. There was no war going on. He was not actually in active service. Remember The Night Watch by Rembrandt. It's a whole world of these grand, dashing, swashbuckling militiamen who were there to protect, but also to have a very good time. <laughs> and I think this is a little earlier, of course, this is 10 years earlier, but it's the same type of portrait. The artist is also applying his or her craft, or his craft, in order to make a living. 
that's and with Rembrandt, who was very attentive to that. Here's a young man, he moves to Amsterdam, he wants to make a splash, a real splash as a painter of grand subjects. So who you paint is, is as important as, as that you paint. Oh gosh, and also for senses, a sense of, of, of community of if you paint a good portrait of one of one of these militia men, perhaps another will commission. Who's networked into whom? Oh, very, very important. And for Rembrandt, who was a towering artist, it wasn't always so easy. And in the early part of his career, he he really has to sort of make a state a grand statement. And these are very original performances, if you like. The the way the lighting comes from, as it were, from the front of the picture, the way the figure engages you with a sort of very frank and quite, in some ways, quite sort of combative look, but also the sheer technique of being able to create the, the armor, the stuff, the sword, the glints of light against metal. This was all quite new, and Rembrandt was taking a bit of a risk, in a way, um, in, in pushing this new language, but it met with immediate recognition. So Rembrandt is also displaying his technique for others, for people who might uh, engage him to see so that that technique captures their imagination. It's also a, a, a sales statement. You're absolutely right. As much as I may resist a little bit the language, <laughs> you're absolutely right. And in fact, by the, by the time of the 50s, a little later than this portrait, the Rembrandt brand, this particular technique, this particular lighting, this particular effect was something that connoisseurs and collectors and patrons and monarchs from beyond the Dutch Republic were keen to, to, to have. And Rembrandt, the, 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 the danger with that is that brands become out of fashion. And then you see his, him trying to adjust in subsequent works, trying to recapture that attention by adjusting technique. Yes, but in fact, he never really gives up his own language. And so by the end of his life, a bankrupt, his mistress incarcerated, um, he's, he's really, in a way, rem lost this primacy, but he won't change the way he paints. And that, too, is something wonderful about artists, that, yes, they may be attentive to the market, yes, they may be attentive to strategy and to relations and networks, but they are also, they have an integrity. How do you maintain integrity in the face of changing styles, changing tastes, and the temptations of doing the thing that that um, is is simply a copy, a shallow copy of somebody else's technique. You have to have real commitment and belief in your in your vision or in your in what you're doing and what you believe is right. And yes, of course, you have to be flexible and you have to be malleable to a degree. But at a certain point, you keep going, and that I think that is the case of, of these great artists. Well, let's talk uh, about. Um, Watteau, La Partie Carré. The foursome, Party of Four, actually it has that resonance. Right. Two couples in theatrical costume in a park. There, there's a flirty, uh, gallant sense to this picture. But what are they dressed as? These are, they're not dressed in contemporary costume. They are wearing theatrical costume, the costume of the fair theatre, the Commedia dell'arte, the clowns, and blackguards that cavorted on stage. And Vato took that rather brash theatrical world and poetized it. He brings it into an aristocratic garden. We have these beautiful young women. The man who's back to us is Piero, the foolish clown. But he's not really foolish here. He's, we don't, for, to see him from the back with his guitar hanging, we don't know what he's thinking. We, we sense that he is, hoping that something will develop with, the, with one of these two lovely women. And these two young women are, are attentive to him, and the, the other gentleman is, is uh, sitting off to the side. Uh... I think we've all been there, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think that, in a way, Vato captures something of how is, this, how is this going to work out. And because he's a very learned artist and a very sophisticated artist, when we look in the landscape, we see these putti, these little angels on a dolphin. It's a garden piece of garden statuary. That is also a symbol for expectant desire, desire held in check. The dolphin wants to move forward. The putti are love, love images are holding him back for the moment. And in a way, it, it, it resonates with what's playing out in this scene. And Vata would have hoped that his audience would have understood that. In this time and place, 
how do these kinds of works come together? Is, is, would would uh, Watteau have had a patron uh, for this, or would this have been the type of work that uh, he would be exploring himself and then? That's a very good question, and I wish I had an, a quick answer. We, we actually don't know. Watteau, this is a small picture meant to be in a private collection. Right. Perhaps it would have hung with Dutch paintings from the earlier century, which it has a slight affinity with. It would have also been a, it would have been attractive to a group of uh, elegant, art-loving connoisseurs who were attentive to Vato, who was the artist on the on the rise. Well, it creates an atmosphere within the room as well. So you're you're creating a type of energy in this in this uh, room, and you have the, the theme are young people um, acting flirtatiously uh, toward one one another. Um, you could you could see this this idea of creating environments and having the artists and and their patrons collaborate. The co it, idea of collaboration actually you're 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 touching on some sort of key recent issues in scholarship on Vato. This idea of uh, the world, uh, the culture that Vato is as an artist representing, portraying, but also with his collectors and patrons sharing. And yes, this is gallant erotic but polite and, it, and, and expectant. And those themes mesh well with what Paris was in the years after Louis XIV's death, where the Regency, where it was an open, more exciting, more vibrant, more luxurious community. And though we can enter that picture in that way. This really has to be done with, with a real consciousness of, of time, of place, uh, because these works were very, very difficult to make. It, it was a different mindset at that time. Vato dies at 37. He is immensely precious to have because he works like Vermeer. He painted more than Vermeer, but at least, but, but not, not a huge amount more. And what's wonderful is that through a painting like this, you can today enter the world of the theater, the Commedia dell'arte. You can think about life and letters in this Paris of the Regency, but you can also react to issues about courtship and, and longing that are timeless. And you cannot get a sense of the history and the culture and the life of a people just by reading text in a book. That's one of the great um, powers of great works of art, that they expand you in every direction and uh, they can both embed themselves in a particular moment, but they also open up much, much more widely. And that's why I think Vato, among many of the artists that we are talking about, Vato is adored by people. There's something magic about his work. Even if you're not quite sure why, you're drawn in. And I think the museum's job is to, A, give you the opportunity to be drawn in by seeing these works well shown, beautifully kept but then also to find ways of allowing you to, once you're in the world, to learn more. How do you see education and public programming uh, working within museums to uh, help people have a really engaging, enjoyable experience um, that, that they just love to repeat and repeat and repeat? Um, it's, it's a big question, and one of the, one of the uh, opportunities that excites me is to in, in an increasingly techn technological world, to slow down and feel confident that looking at a single work or a group of works, beginning to not worry too much about history or facts or the history of the artist, the meaning of the picture, just beginning to look, to let your eyes, mind, heart travel a bit with this. And then to have, through excellent educators, to begin a conversation or a dialogue, to get you to feel comfortable to express what you're seeing, what you're liking, what puzzles you, to then be led a little more to, to some of the inside information that the specialists know. And I, and I think that we can be more confident in the objects, allowing us to then have these conversations, these dialogues. And yes, if someone is thrilled to learn more, we can lead them to that. Well, you also, there you can come back to technology. Technology Absolutely. unfolds uh, information and, and uh, finding ways in which you can take the, the art and combine it with information and create these multidimensional experiences. Is... I, I couldn't agree more, but 
I'm also very keen that we return some confidence to the, the, the encounter with the work. And the encounter amongst people, uh, yes. uh, amongst people who might um, know a lot and people who want to learn a lot. And also among people who are just the, the notion too, occasionally, of being in a small group where a conversation, a dialogue grows. Someone looks, someone responds, they're not intimidated that there's an answer, there's a right answer, they feel enabled to make a point that may be right or may be wrong, but they're not worried. I've seen this again and again, and how once people sort of get, lose that sense of anxiety or little anxiety they may have, if they're enjoying it, I mean, not everyone may like this art, and they're not, they don't have to, there's many different types of art to look at, but there is an enjoyment factor. And I think that is something which we can be but you know, that's a really important launching point. Well, and to talk about many different types of art, let's, let's talk about Tepelo. The goddess Flora, who was the goddess of fertility, of flowers, of spring, became, became somewhat licentious goddess for the Floralia, these games that happened every spring to sort of bring in the regeneration, if you like. And this is a fantastic painting by one of the great the greatest 18th century for artists in any country, Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, who was a great decorator, a muralist, a, a painter of huge mythologies in palaces and villas in Venice and around, but then also with a European reputation. This picture, in fact, was a, was a very important one for him. It was done as part of a pair for Count Algarotti, who was the minister, uh, helping the minister in Dresden create an art collection. So Algarotti was, in a way, the, the point person to create the collection for one of the richest uh, and most powerful monarchs in Europe. And Algarotti knew Tiepolo. So Tiepolo, who he was, Tiepolo made a gesture. He painted these two pictures for the Count, who was a well-known connoisseur, and they were as a, as, a, as a gift. So the artist here is promoting, I mean, promoting himself, he's assisting in his productivity in his potential market and he's painting at the top of his game. This is the most flamboyant, the most exciting, the most sensuous picture by this artist, one of the most. The colors are fantastic. They are, it's an impeccable state of conservation and preservation and we do feel that everything is possible. Life is fully, <laughs> fully burgeoning. Fast forward another uh, 60, 70 years to one of your great loves, um, Manet. Manet, um, an artist who died too young, actually, who died in his 50s, who left a, a limited oeuvre that revolutionized, literally changed the way modern art would look. The father of the Impressionists, never painting with the Impressionists, but sort of encouraging them to move forward. And to have a painting by Manet is, the, the fine arts has more than one. And, and to have works by him is really a thrill. This is the milliner. It's a picture that didn't sell. He didn't sell it. He may not have finished it. It was in his collection when he died. And just looking at the picture, it, it's a little strange. The, the painting has been called at the milliner's, at the hat shop. Do you go to a hat shop in Desabi? Do you go to a hat shop with your shoulders bare? Right. You don't. So what is happening here? Yes, there are hats. There's a very elegant woman. Who is who's really showing her upper her shoulders, and she's putting on hats, or is she in a shop? Is she in a shop at all? Uh -huh. Or is she at home? Or is she a woman of a certain either a certain luxury or a certain type of woman, a courtesan perhaps, who has in her boudoir next to her boudoir a room with some of the costume? Now, women as artists were not prominently featured um, in earlier times. Um, and uh, nevertheless, we know that women uh, have created art uh, throughout human history. Georgia O'Keeffe has such a prominent space in the art world, in American art, in the development of, of American art. Talk about uh, Petunias. Immediately recognizable. Um, painted in the 20s, before she moves to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we associate her for much of her la the last part of her career. But she was with Stieglitz, who, this wonderful photographer, this gallerist, this visionary in modern art, whom she 
married finally. Great love, a great friendship, a great collaboration. collaboration. Absolutely, absolutely. And Sometimes he, stormy. Yes, and he of course discovered her. He actually showed her drawings, abstract drawings in 1915 before anyone was doing this sort of work and um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. This is painted from in Lake George in, in the Adirondacks um, where he's, he had a house and we can't, when we look at it, but think of fertility and of femininity, of some sense of um, almost generation. George O'Keefe got quite frustrated, even in her own day, with a Freudian reading of her flower paintings. She felt that she was looking at flowers. She was looking at them so closely, so carefully. This is how they appeared to her. They appeared big to her. They appeared powerful to her. She, was, she had a little truck with saying that this was a Freudian symbol of femininity, of the power of the feminine. But we can't get away from that because this picture just does envelop us. We can almost sense, we can almost smell the perfume. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then we have Grant Wood's Dinner for Threshers. I, I love this picture. You lose yourself in it. You follow the story. You see these sunburned faces. These are men who have been out in the field. They've been wearing hats. They take their hats off for, for lunch. So they're all, they've all got these white, these white foreheads. It's beautifully observed. But the longer you look at it, you realize, well, it's painted in 1934, but why are they, where are we? Even in post-depression rural life, it wasn't quite as old-fashioned as this. And we learn that when we look at the barn on the left, we see that there is a, a date of 1892. It's hard to see, but it's, it's inscribed just under the awning. Mm. And Wood thought he was born in 1892, he was born in 1891. But he, when he painted this in 1934, it's a nostalgic picture. He's looking back, he's remembering the life he led as a farm boy and of this ritual of having the threshers at lunch after they'd worked during the day. There are three, three men who are not quite able to sit at the table because the table is full. And he writes, this was my home. These were our hens. This was my mother's china. So for him, it's, it's not modern life. It is a memory. And this is just a tiny, the tiniest slice of, of the collection. And we are not doing any justice to the, um, to the museum's uh, uh, Africa holdings. We're doing no justice to its Asian holdings and, and uh, the, the other holdings. Um, but let's talk about three gumball machines. Now, if there is a more quintessentially American image than three gumball machines, uh, I don't know what it would be. And, and here, you, your first, I think one's first reaction is just how joyful and how bright and how luminous and how happy one feels looking at these quotidian, banal objects. And the pleasure that Thiebo takes in doing these touch of highlights, these white crescent highlights on each of the gummy balls that you, that's going to fall out. But the whole, the tripartite, the trio of, of images with their blue shadows, when we get close we see that the paint is literally like sculpted on. There are, he's drawing our attention to the, the means of, 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 of creating this. A painting perhaps about wanting more than we can have, about consumerism, but also about childhood pleasures. And, and it's also, I, for me, coming to this, it feels like the, the early, an early um, excitement about pop art, about what could be done on canvas with paint that had not been done before. And Thiebo was a commercial artist. He was an artist who worked for Disney. He did Pinocchio. And Warhol is working in a, in a, in a different language on the other coast at, at the same time. And I've loved this artist. I've seen quite a lot of his work. And I just, when I look at this, I just feel happy.